move from uh, financial networks to quantum information. Uh, I invite here Professor Paolo Zanardi from the University of Southern California. Your presentation should be here, hopefully. Here you are. So let's see. Hi. So thank you for being here. It's, it's a pleasure. And yeah, so I belong to the old ISI. You know, those guys that back in the day were working on the quantum stuff and the core foundational theoretical part of it. Now I, I learned that I'm on the right wing as well, right in the arc of science. And uh, well, that's kind of a new thing to me. And uh, okay, but today uh, I want to, you know, I couldn't help. Uh, okay. So I think. I'll try. Of course, we quantum guys, we can't really compete with this networks people with all those cool images, uh, posters from Hollywood movies, with zombies and stuff. Yeah, it's kind of hard. I'm from Hollywood personally, so I understand the, the, the charm of that. Uh, but I try nevertheless to make my talk slightly more appealing. And uh, Well, it's not my talk. This, the, well, okay, let's see where it works. Okay, so, well, I'm, I'm, I'll try to make the point that we old people can help out the new people in doing stuff they are really interested in. And so my talk is going to be about the quantum and the cyberspace. I understand that nowadays the more uh, fashionable term is big data, but, yeah, you know, I was a teenager in the 80s and I would read uh, William Gibson and uh, Neuromont, and so I think I still like the cyberspace word better. And, well, let me show what the cyberspace is. Well, is this. This is a picture of the internet. Well, I guess it's just artist rendering of that. It's a pretty complex network. And we, well, we heard uh, already a lot about these complex networks. And let me say a few words about that. Because you know, we are quite often told that we live in this information age or big data. Well, having lots of data out there is pretty much useless unless you can actually efficiently retrieve those data and you can make use of them. So this is a, a pretty important problem and by no means is a new one. Actually, as it turns out, you know, even uh, information retrieval has a very long history. As a matter of fact, tags of, with table contents where we're attached to papyrus rolls uh, they were summarizing the document content in order to make people uh, to allow people to get uh, to get the stuff that was inside. Of course, this is pretty old stuff, and we may be more familiar with this type of uh, systematization to get people uh, able to retrieve information uh, in an efficient way. Well, but th those were uh, all the type of uh, documents, and nowadays, well, I would say f uh, since uh, 1988, a new type of library arose, so was born and really changed the world. And actually, uh, Rita Levi-Montancini said, well, what is the most important discovery of the 19th century or the 20th century? He said, is the internet. Well, the internet is a big thing, per se, but it's the hardware, that, uh, but you know, it would be pretty much nothing without this thing here, without the World Wide Web, right? So this is the protocol that makes uh, the internet a useful place where you have to look for stuff, and you can pretty much find everything you're interested in and, but, well, it's a, very, uh, it's a very complex place. Actually, if there's one thing sure about the internet, is that the internet, well, the internet, the World Wide Web, actually, so this is the set of, of web pages we have out there, is a very big place. So as you can see there, this is a graph where on the x-axis we have time till January 2012, and the, on the y-axis we have just a number of web pages. And in case you can't read that, the, uh, the unit on the y-axis is billions of web pages. And you can see, well, now we are order of, what, 50 billions of web pages? And out there, so it's almost sure that there is the stuff we are interested in, but the point is, how do we get there? So we can sort of help uh, 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 to feel in the way the Borges felt in the uh, famous novel, The Library of Babel, uh, he said, the certitude that in some shelf, in some hexagon, held precious books, and that these precious books were inaccessible seemed almost intolerable. So this is the way sometimes we feel about what the cyberspace out there, how we get information, how we retrieve that information in a, in a 
in an efficient, in an easy way, in a fast way to make it simple. Well, in, uh, in 1998, that's another important date, this uh, couple of guys, by then uh, unknown, young, and this is another key thing that we heard in these days, young people, Sergey Brin, uh, Lawrence, uh, Larry Page, they wrote this paper. It's just a research paper during their PhD, and it's called The Anatomy of a Large-Scale Hypertextual Web Search Engine. Well, that was the basic, the first paper about the, what uh, uh, became to be known as Google. So, and what those guys were doing was a, actually a pretty, a pretty abstract research in graph theory, if you wish. And they were just devising an algorithm that was uh, sort of able to uh, explore the structure of a complex, of, a compl of what now we call a complex network. And what were they doing back then? And, and they thought it was a big thing. I think these guys, they had, from the, from the outset, the feeling that something big was going to happen. Probably they couldn't predict that like 15 years later they would each worth 50 billion dollars each. But you know, this is things that may happen when you pursue pure science just for the sake of it and you may end up being one of the most important innovators of your age. And this is yet another thing that I think the ISI is, is trying to uh, foster here. So let me tell you what Google does or, well, the core of Google back then. Well, Google calculates uh, an eigenvector. So I'm sorry, I'm an old guy and I still like equations, and this is, but this is pretty much the only equation I'm gonna write, g pi equal pi. So uh, pi is the page rank vector, is at its entries they contain, uh, they contain information about the importance or the relative importance of all the web pages uh, in, the, in, the, in the internet or in this graph. So more technically, pi is a stationary state of a surfer. Well, I'm from California. We like to think that everybody's surfing around. And you randomly surf on, on, on the internet from one page to the other. And if you wait sufficiently long time, you can ask yourself, what is the fraction of time that this random surfer would spend in each page? And uh, well, and if this number is large, you say that this page is important. And you give a number to it. And this is the entry in that vector of that particular page. And you order the pages in this way. Okay, so this is a computational problem. It's just inverting a linear set of equations. People like Seth Lloyd already worked on this problem in a quantum fashion. The thing is that even from a computer scientist's point of view, this is sort of an easy problem, polynomial complexity. Uh, given the huge size, the humongous size of the, of the internet, computing that pi vector, the stationary state, the page rank vector, is still an exceedingly hard computational task. Even given all the power, the computational power, the big G us, well, it takes weeks to update this page rank. So the question is, well, can we, quantum guys, help in this particular task? Can we figure out some way to uh, exploit uh, the computational extra power that apparently quantum mechanics brings in uh, uh, to help uh, uh, to make the search more efficient? And this is kind of an outrageous idea, if you think about it. But well, you know, we are tenured professors, so we can sort of afford that. And uh, with a few colleagues at the ISI, we thought, OK, let's try. Let's try that out. So uh, that black box there is our quantum computer. We actually own one of those guys. And there's a particular type of quantum computer. It's called an adiabatic quantum computer. I'll try to explain with no formula what adiabatic quantum computation is all about. And I'll try to convince you that indeed there's some advantage in, in using that. Well, so adiabatic quantum computation is a, is, a, uh, is a model of quantum computation where you actually encode your problem in the fundamental, in the lowest energy state of some quantum Hamiltonian. And you start from some uh, uh, initial Hamiltonian that is easy to prepare, some system you can engineer in such a way that its ground state is easy to achieve. And then you sort of change the parameters in your Hamiltonian and you move along that path in the parameter space in such a way that the final uh, uh, ground state of the final Hamiltonian encodes for the problem you're looking for. So in this particular example, we designed a quantum Hamiltonian whose ground state contains information about the global structure of the internet. Or if you wish, uh, a, a ground state is basically the page rank vector. Okay? So we're going to slowly change the parameters of the Hamiltonian. 
and we get to the final state, and then we perform a measurement of this final state, and this hopefully is going to give some information about the state. But the real point here is how fast or how efficient this way of doing things is. And in particular is the question as to whether it's, it provides any advantage with respect to the classical means. Well, let's say, uh, well, maybe now I got, well, of course, we couldn't quite test our ideas on the real internet. Uh, we do have a quantum computer, if you wish, but that's just 500 qubits for, for the time being. And, and well, and the web is billions of pages. So rather than doing that, we would uh, we use this web graphs, uh, basically our abstract mathematical model uh, that contains, uh, they encode some of the key properties of the real internet or some of the properties the real inter internet network is supposed to have as a sparse, as a small world, and as a scale free. And, and, and so we have this mathematical model on, on the right, and we could check our algorithm, this new quantum idea to do things in this web graphs. And, and this is shown in the next slide. I'm afraid the next slide is kind of a technical slide, but don't worry. You know, it's the only take home message you have from here is this formula, is this formula here. This is a bit for experts, I understand that, and I apologize. But this is the time it takes to prepare the page rank vector encoded in the ground state of this quantum Hamiltonian. And, and, and the great news is this, well, it's basically just this part here. You have a logarithm. So the computational time of our algorithm, uh, at least for some web graphs, scales logarithmically with the number of pages in the, in the, in the network. And this is great news because the best classical algorithm for doing that, based on power method or uh, Monte Carlo type algorithm, is a polynomial algorithm. And so this would mean, its face value, that quantum mechanics did it again. So provided some exponential speed up, uh, exponentially faster way of solving a problem. Well, that would be great. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, is not the whole story. This is just the beginning of a long journey, I believe. And, and I'm just sharing with you these first steps. Because as it turns out, this adiabatic quantum algorithm is exponentially faster at preparing the ground state and that encodes the information you're after. But then, you know, quantum mechanics is a funny thing. You have is, a sto is an inherently stochastic theory. In order to extract information out, you have to perform measurements. And when it comes to this measurement stage of the algorithm, well, things get uh, uh, not so good anymore, and you're sort of back to the polynomial complexity class. But still, and, uh, under some assumptions, you still have an advantage. So for computer scientists in the audience, you move from like uh, uh, power n, the scale, linear scaling with the system size, to uh, uh, n to the alpha, where alpha is a little smaller than, than 1. OK? Big deal? Well, not for a computational person, but in practice, it may, sa may save you lots of time. Of course, you have to have a quantum computer. And this, we are back to square one in a way. But this, well, this is the challenge we are facing. And we have been facing for 17 years at the ISI. Uh, ever since uh, Mario Rossetti and I started you know, to looking into that and try to find out a way to, uh, to have a stable quantum computer. Well, uh, I think I'm, I'm almost done. Well, 12 minutes, I'm perfect. So they, well, let me just conclude in this way. The information retrieval in big data spaces provides a, a very interesting new set of problems for quantum information science. So there is really a great opportunity, a room for interactions between the old uh, mathematical, theoretical type quantum physicists like myself and the new uh, young innovators, uh, uh, quantum uh, complex networks guys. And, uh, and why should we do that? Well, the humongous side of the internet is very important motivation to look for whatever quantum speed up. So how, it doesn't matter how small, uh, how small is you know, the improvement in the performance you may have using the quantum thing. Well, this is worthwhile. It's something that you want to really look into that. And well, we started doing that, and we uh, figured out this adiabatic quantum page rank algorithm. And it may indeed, in some occasion, provide some, uh, uh, some speed up. But this is just, you know, and I wa wanted to share with you, especially with the network people, because really this is, it might well be the starting point of a joint venture, a very profitable one for both sides. And I'm really interested into that. And actually, I'll conclude, like, 
thank you for the attention and very importantly to thank a couple of guys that have been working with me on this project and I'm very glad to introduce Silvano Garnerone that is a former ISI person actually is a student of Mario and this guy is really the primary driving force in trying to bring together the complex network and the quantum and so yeah I'm very grateful that he got me involved in this and my uh, friend uh, Daniel Lidar from the University of Southern California and well I guess uh, I'll stop here thanking my the funders and maybe this is work. So we are working on quantum information, but look at the people who's giving us money. Lockheed Martin, Google, NASA. And each of these actors nowadays they have their own quantum computer, they have their own quantum group working on stuff. So you know quantum is still alive and the complex net and the marriage with quantum with complex networks I think is gonna be a very happy one. Thank you very much for your attention.